What's up everybody? Welcome to part four of our video series where we tackle the question of whether or not we can trust the Bible. Today we're going to look at how the original manuscripts for the Bible were copied throughout time. Critics will often say that the issue with the Bible is not the original manuscripts, it's with the people who copied and potentially manipulated the manuscripts over time. They say that because the Bible has so many authors and even more scribes responsible for transferring the text, there's no possible way that what we currently have is accurate to what was first written. They often reference the game of telephone where you start with a long line of people, the phrase starts at one end and you whisper the phrase into each other's ears down the line and by the time you get to the end the phrase is totally different. So they say the Bible is like playing a game of telephone for thousands of years. So I want to take a closer look at this question and see how the Bible actually holds up. Again for this video I'm going to be pulling a lot of information from the book Evidence That Demands a Verdict. First let's look at the scribes. We tend to have this idea that anyone that could write or copy a document could end up being a scribe for the biblical manuscripts. And that's just not the case. If we look at early writings from various rabbi at the time, scribes were highly educated and influential people. They're often described as having intimate knowledge of the documents they were working with, and they're usually descendants of priests. But the education of the scribe is not the only characteristic we can point to for the probability of an accurate transmission. We can also look at the incredibly strict rules that these scribes went through when copying the manuscripts. First, the scribe needed to to wash himself and then be in full Jewish dress before even beginning the writing process. They could only use parchment from clean animals. Each column could be no fewer than 48 and no more than 60 lines of text. The width of those columns needed to be exactly 30 letters. The ink needed to be black. No single letter could be written from memory, so they had to have the other document right in front of them. When writing God's name, they couldn't use a recently dipped pen or brush. And they couldn't even look at anyone else when they were writing the name. Depending on what section the scribes were copying at the time, they weren't even supposed to stop or be interrupted, even if it meant missing other religious duties like prayer. These rules don't necessarily prove an accurate transmission, but it helps build the case. But what if in the process of following these rules, the scribes made a mistake? Well, we have ancient Jewish writings that showed that the temples would employ correctors to review copies manuscripts and ensure accuracy. So you can see that the analogy of the telephone game doesn't really fit this process. These scribes weren't off by themselves manipulating theology and then sneaking the scrolls into the temple when no one was looking. This was a formal process with many checks and balances. That being said, critics of the Bible are correct to point out that even though this process existed, we still have variances in the manuscripts. The good news is that throughout history we've had people investigate the documents, collect and evaluate the necessary evidence, and then determine the most plausible reading. First of all, we have to deal with the fact that there were unintentional mistakes in the copying of manuscripts. I can speak firsthand from experience that even though there may be a process where multiple people review a document over and over and over again, there's still going to be a mistake that slips through and it's super embarrassing. But Josh and Sean McDowell point out the errors that are made and how they're explained. First, we have mistaken letters. Even though the scribes were mandated to write in a certain way, it's really hard to distinguish between some of these letters. For example, the D and the R look shockingly similar. This explains why in Genesis we see a people referred to as Dodonim, but in 1 Chronicles they're referred to as Rodonim. Second, there's the mistake of words that sound similar. It would be like us mistaking the different forms of the word there. Thirdly, we have the mistake of just missing a letter. This happens to us all the time when we are typing or writing. Your mind starts working faster than you can write and you just end up skipping a letter. And lastly, we have the doubling of a letter or a word. In the early manuscripts of Jeremiah, the word for he drew a bow was written twice. This doesn't mean that he actually drew his bow twice. It's just a mistake and it's been corrected now. Ideally, these last two types of errors would have been caught by the correctors, but mistakes slip through. It happens. But it's not just unintentional mistakes. We also know that the scribes made intentional changes to the manuscripts. That might seem strange given the rigorous process that we looked at earlier, but I think it'll make sense as we go through the changes. Most of these changes can be boiled down to two reasons. First, the scribes were known to be so diligent in their process of copying that they would often copy the notes in the margins of the document. And second, they wanted to expand certain sections of the document to make them more easily understandable. Some of these changes needed to be made because the language the document was written in was being updated at the same time. So as the language is developing, or if the document is being sent to a region where the dialect is a little different, those changes would be made by the scribes. Another change made by the scribes was to update older manuscripts so they made sense at that time. For example, in Genesis we read that Abraham pursued the people that had captured Lot, and they went as far as the city of Dan. But according to the books of Judges and Joshua, the city was not known as Dan until much later. So this is not a mistake, it's just the scribe updating the name of a location so it makes sense to that audience. There's also a few examples of scribes changing wording so it's less offensive in certain cultures. For example, one reading of 2 Samuel says that David despised the Lord, but another reading says that David despised the word of the Lord. The meaning is basically the same, but one is a little easier to hear. And then we also have theological changes by the scribes. Wait, you mean to tell me that the scribes changed theology? Yep. 
For example, an older manuscript of Genesis says that God remained standing before Abraham. But the scribes found this to be theologically incorrect, because in that culture, standing before someone presented a form of servitude to that person. So they swapped the sentence structure so that Abraham was standing before God. And the rest of the changes can be chalked up to swapping out a word so it makes more sense, or expanding on a section so that it's easier to understand. Now I do want to quickly touch on the selection process that we use for the manuscripts in our translation. Since the Bible was translated into many different languages, and we have a lot of different copies of manuscripts to choose from, I think it's awesome that the people that translate the Bible for us are very selective in the manuscripts that they actually use. For example, when it comes to the Old Testament, most of the manuscripts come from the Hebrew translation of the Masoretic text and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which you've probably heard of, and the Greek translation, also known as the Septuagint. For the Masoretic text, these were manuscripts maintained by a group of Jewish scholars in the 8th century AD. And until the mid-1900s, this is pretty much all we had in terms of a Hebrew translation of the Old Testament. But then in the 1940s, seven scrolls were found in a cave about a mile away from the Dead Sea. And and over the next 10 years, over 1,000 scrolls were discovered in the surrounding caves. The oldest of these documents, known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, dates to about 250 BC, and the latest one we have is about 70 AD. Now the cool thing about the Dead Sea Scrolls is they prove the reliability of the Masoretic Text. We know that the Masoretic Text began between 700 and 800 AD, and we know that the latest of the Dead Sea Scrolls was written in 70 AD. So we can compare the older Dead Sea Scrolls to the newer Masoretic Text and see if the Old Testament changes over time. And the good news is, with the the exception of the changes we've mentioned earlier, the stories are basically the same. So now, let's talk about the Septuagint. In 330 BC, Alexander the Great had recently finished his conquest of the Middle East. Because of this, the language in the area began to move towards Greek, which meant that the Old Testament was also translated into Greek. But what we find is that over time, the Septuagint began to differ from the Hebrew translation of the Old Testament. Depending on the version of the Septuagint, it would include five to ten additional books. And second, there were differences in the text when compared to the Hebrew version. So as I began reading through this section of history, I began to get concerned because I didn't want the Septuagint used in my translation of the Bible. And it turns Turns out other translators thought the same thing. For the most part, I used the English Standard Version of the Bible, and the translators let us know that unless absolutely necessary, the Septuagint was not used in the translation of the Old Testament. Many versions of the Bible that we have today are word-for-word -word translations. In the Hebrew translation of the Old Testament, there are less than 10,000 unique words used, and there are maybe 80,000 words total in the whole language. Contrast that with the English language that has over 200,000 words. So in the process of trying to select the proper word for the translation, translators may have turned to the Septuagint as a last ditch effort. So hopefully this inspires a little more confidence for you in the Bible that we have today. I hope you'll stick with me as we continue to answer questions about the Bible. If you want to see more videos like this each week, click here to subscribe. If you want to get caught up on my video from last week, click or tap right here. Thanks again for tuning in and I will see you next week.